Welcome back. We certainly hope you enjoyed the break and took time to visit the wonderful exhibitors at this conference. At this time, we're going to continue our discussion on North Dakota homegrown innovation. North Dakota is full of very smart, enterprising folks who bring the industry the solutions needed to gain efficiencies and be on the path to continuous improvement. Moderating this session will be Dr. James Lehman, Director, North Dakota Department of Commerce. As the North Dakota Commerce Commissioner, James oversees economic development, tourism, marketing, workforce development, and community, community development efforts for the state. James recently served as the Director of Economic Development and Finance for the North Dakota Department of Commerce. Before arriving in the Midwest, James managed a significant transformation portfolio at the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington. Before joining the VA, James managed several national security programs at the Departments of Homeland Security, State and Agriculture, where counterterrorism efforts were the focus. Areas of operation included the U.S.-Mexico border, the Caribbean, and Persian Gulf. James also served in the Army and is a proud veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom. Here, he was recognized for achievement overseas by serving as an intelligence analyst and interpreter. After over a decade of fighting terrorism, James sought to use his skills to solve domestic issues. Please help me in welcoming Dr. James Lehman. Is this thing on? There we go. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and uh, very thankful that you're joining us today for this, uh, this panel. Um, as you're well aware, the market is changing. Um, we're seeing a transformative sort of environmental, social, corporate governance movement. We're seeing a regulatory current, and we're simultaneously seeing new market demands for those who buy our electrons. And as a result, it's super important today to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship especially regarding what we can accomplish here in the state of North Dakota. If one were to look at North Dakota as a prism in terms of the agricultural advances we've made over the last 40 to 50 years, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to replicate it and even do better in energy. I'm joined today by a slate of panelists that are gonna talk through a number of innovations that they're currently involved in to help our state become more agile, to help our state meet ESG demands more effectively, to help our state transform, uh, transform technologically, and also to pass our state's intellectual capital, if you will, and sell it so that we could provide national security and global energy demand um, in, in efforts that we've never been able to accomplish in the past. So I'd like to join, uh, please join me in welcoming this panel. Our first speaker today will be um, Mr. Eric Deal. Mr. Deal is a professional geologist and registered environmental manager with over 35 years of experience in government relations, multidisciplinary energy, environmental and engineering projects. As a director of government relations in the Denver division of EOG Resources, he is responsible for government relations, environmental planning, environmental and regulatory issues, and legislative liaison for the Rocky Mountain states that the division operates. He is also a part of the EOG sustainability group working on ESG issues. He has extensive working knowledge of natural resource issues affecting oil and gas operations, including air quality, water quality, biological resources, land use policies, etc. He has worked in the oil and gas exploratory drilling operations as an on-site geologist, landman, and mud logger. Mr. Deal was a former chair of the NDPC and lead and led the, international, or the initial NDPC flaring task force to increase natural gas capture in North Dakota. Help me in welcoming Eric. Thank you, James. Uh, great to be here, everybody, to see you in North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> I've been down in Houston for a few years, and it's great to be back, uh, a semblance of normalcy here. And today I get to talk uh, 
about some exciting stuff, uh, engaging your employees for technical innovation. And as we know, uh, technical innovation is going to be the key to a low carbon future, uh, which ESG is asking us to do. This is just the standard legal language on my talk, uh, so anything I can say is uh, subject to change, and uh, please don't send me to jail. So really, I want to talk about a few things today, EOG's culture and how it drives our uh, innovation, how we feel it gives us a uh, competitive advantage. So really, um, our culture is very important to us, and it should be important to you and your company. Um, and it's really our performance and our approach to innovation, and I'll address that through the talk. Um, i also uh, talk about innovation in three broad areas. First will be operations, then information technology, then sustainability. Uh, really, they're looking at the environmental aspect. And then um, I uh, just wanted, last week, EOG reported our earnings, and uh, we had the second best quarter ever in the history of our company, and I'm not here to talk about that. So if you want to look at our earnings and uh, what was reported last week, uh, I'll refer you to our investor relations uh, on our website, uh, the tab on our website. So why is culture so important for your companies, for our company? We, we see it's uh, really important for a competitive advantage. We call it uh, being pleased but not satisfied. And what is our culture? You can see here in the, the middle strip there, uh, this is every employee. Um, we expect them to know this, that we're returns driven. We're decentralized and non-bureaucratic. Our operations in the Bakken are not necessarily dependent on operations in the Permian, ba uh, Permian Basin. We have multidisciplinary teams. In other words, production sits with completion, sits with drilling, everybody on the same team. Uh, we're very innovative and entrepreneurial. And this one, uh, uh, is really important to our, our culture. Every business employee, every employee is a business person. And that's really key. So even if you're the CEO or you're an admin person or even in government relations, uh, you're expected to be a business person, make business decisions uh, in your area of business. And we actually went out, our CEO asked everybody in the innovation world, uh, in the innovation side said, I want you all to come up with ideas to be innovative, uh, how we can move into a low carbon future and we were swamped. Out of our 2,500 employees, there were so many ideas that came out. We actually stood up a group that started to filter through all the ideas and start seeing, putting uh, pen, bench tests together and pilot studies together. So it was really important there. Of course, we the safety, environment, and community aspect of it. But you can see here, um, it's across all, all aspects of our operations, so exploration, operations, information, technology, and then sustainability. So really, our culture, we feel our culture is driving us again uh, to emerge from the downturn even stronger than before. And again, I'll refer your, our financial performance for the first quarter in 2021 uh, to our website. So in operations, uh, these are our goals of what we're uh, trying to do is to be the low cost operator. Always, that's across the value chain from soup to nuts, always uh, looking at different things. Uh, we want to be a leader in the industry on drilling completion techniques, so uh, we're always trying new things. We have R&D wells, a percentage that are uh, always experimenting with new techniques, new ideas, and again, back to the employees that are looking, uh, looking and drilling, doing those completions. What are their ideas? How can we be smarter, faster, better? The proven track record is really repeatability. What is it uh, that we can repeat across basins that's very innovative, uh, there's a lot, a lot of cross-pollinization ideas, people meet together, all the drilling guys to get together and play golf, I think, is what they do, and uh, uh, talk about different ideas on what they're going to do. Uh, the high realized product prices is really we, our marketing group is always looking where the next molecule goes to get the highest price. Uh, we can divert shipments, uh, train shipments to different places around the country. Uh, a Bakken uh, molecule may go somewhere at St. Uh, James, Louisiana, or it may go somewhere else, it may go to the Gulf Coast of Texas. Um, in the self-sourcing of materials, uh, we started the first uh, rail shipment uh, in North Dakota in 2010 uh, out near Stanley. Uh, we also were one of the first companies to self-source sand and then water reuse. We've been doing that for a long time. The point here is that that all really drives 
uh, innovation across all disciplines. And lately, on our completions, we've been going to super zipper fracks, uh, is what we're calling, super zippers. That's where we use one single frac spread and we split uh, on a, about a four pad, uh, four well pad. We split the, uh, the horsepower and the operation into two different sides. We use about half uh, to do uh, fracks and then half uh, the wells are being wireline, uh, will have wireline operations. Again, that's trying to keep our costs down low. So this innovation has driven us to what we've recently called uh, premium. If you're following EOG all, at all, we have recently gone to double premium. And double premium is our wells that yield 60% direct after tax rate of return at $40 oil. And uh, uh, that's WTI and $2.50 at gas. So we're now moving, that's our baseline. So we're moving because of innovation from premium to double premium wells. That's our baseline well. We don't, we try not to drill anything that's not meeting those. And how do we do that? So we embrace challenge, like I said before, this pleased but not satisfied. Again, that's the idea of challenge everything, change it if you can, see if it works. Um, we're also a very decentralized structure. Uh, we, our decision making is at the, at the division level. So if one division comes up with an idea uh, in your company, uh, that can be implemented, then that can be uh, replicated across multiple plays, and again, re that idea of repeatability. We obviously take uh, advantage of learnings from other plays and bring those ideas into, um, into other areas. For example, the Bakken, uh, we brought up some of our horizontal, in 2005, when we first got into the Bakken, we brought up uh, horizontal drilling and completion technology that was really in the Barnett Shale. Am I hitting the button there? <laughs> Sorry. So um, what this is all done has driven our prices down. You can see uh, in the Eagle Ford there, in the, in the uh, Delaware Basin, the work camp, in the Powder River Basin, our, our costs are coming down dramatically. So what does that mean? The innovation is driving our costs, the low carbon future, all that is really important for us to uh, move forward. And then on this last, uh, over on the bottom on the right there, the sustainable cost reductions, we think about 75% of our cost reductions are due to innovation. So that's your employees, that's the other things that you're doing. Only 25% of our cost reduction is really due to cyclical service costs. So we uh, asked ourselves, can we really measure innovation? Can you measure it within your company? So this is, uh, we say yes. So. This is a, an EOG production per employee versus our total employees. So over on the left, you see uh, MBOE per employee on the left side, and on the right side of the graph is the number of employees. So our number of employees have stayed relatively flat, and yet we've driven 38% increase in our production per employee. So you can see about 2015 in the lower right-hand part of that graph, this is when we started drilling premium wells, and now we're driving, that was, our original premium wells were at 30% rate of return at $40 oil. Now we're going to 60% rate of return at $40 oil. So we, we expect this to even get better and drive us to a different, different level on our innovation. So one of the big areas, obviously, that does this is information technology that allows us to do that. It's super important. And uh, we, we say around uh, EOG, the IT people are breeding like rabbits. So. Um, they are innovating everything. We put a computer sensor in everything and we're monitoring it. And the idea is to have a, a supply chain of data. So uh, what we want to do, our goals are to have a real-time data-driven decision-making process. So we're seeing on the fly, we can make decisions, whether it's completion or production, optimizing the oil field. So we have internally developed large proprietary and integrated uh, data warehouses. Uh, it's also the very important part of it is the predictive analytics. So from future uh, scenarios, we can run future scenarios on our wells, on what our well production has to be, can be, and uh, that really helps drive, again, our costs and keep things uh, down. We have 140 in-house applications. You can actually see on your iPhone um, the well performance. You can see exactly what pumping rates are. You can see a well, any well in our inventory what's going on at your iPhone. And then again, this idea of continual improvement in the tech. 
So this is a little um, look at this, what we're calling creation to delivery. So in the upper part, you can see um, it's the collection of the data. So we're behind, everything is behind a secure uh, firewall, but you want to create the data in the, in the field. You want to, put, again, put the sensor in every piece of equipment you have. Then you need to transport that real time uh, to a warehouse. And this, th these are gigs of data, many, many gigs of data. And then you have to analyze that. You have to have uh, people that can do the analytics on it. Those are a lot of the time developed uh, in-house. And then uh, you have to deliver that data to the end user. So on the bottom, you can see again, uh, kind of in a cartoon shape, this idea that you have uh, data sensors, uh, you have your network, your servers, that's the infrastructure. Uh, then you uh, go through the process, these nodes of where the analytics are done, and then finally get to the person that's making the decision uh, that can uh, look at, are we doing the right thing, are we optimizing it or not? So again, the idea is through drillings, completion, um, uh, production, environmental ESG is that we can make real-time uh, calls on, uh, on, on those uh, optimization of the, of the information. So here's just a short uh, uh, look at some of our applications of those 140 internal applications. The ones that are highlighted here are the ESG applications. So for example, the environmental one, the safety one, and you can see on the graph on the right the different types of uh, apps that we have and their usage as increasing, and you can tie that to our, what I was showing, the uh, per uh, MBOE, per employee, increasing as innovation. We see this driving the innovation, is that people have the information, we have it real time, and we can make those decisions on the fly. Again, it's safety, um, Trident uh, mentioned here, I'll talk about that a little bit, that's water reuse, and then we have the whole side on our economics and our production. So talking about sustainability or sustainable, um, really I'm just gonna highlight the environmental in innovation on here, but um, we're, we're really committed to the safety environment in our communities. Uh, that's including everywhere we operate, every field office, every, every field, and to ethical conduct, obviously, uh, is very important to us. And then uh, we are a collaborative and inclusive culture. Uh, we actually have a diversity, inclusion, and equity group that's now standing up uh, to start addressing some of the ESG concerns. And then our compensation uh, of our executives has been tied to ESG performance. So we have set a goal to achieve zero routine flaring by 2025. So that's five years ahead of what uh, the current administration wants to do. We've also set an ambition to reach net zero, scope one and scope two, GHD emissions by 2040. So that's 10 years ahead of the Paris Accord. So those are again our goals and our ambition. So how are we gonna do that? <clears throat> the top graph really talks about this innovation again driving the ESG, the greenhouse gas, uh, down to our target of uh, our intensity rate there. That's uh, greenhouse gas emissions per barrel of oil produced. And so we're trying to push that down. Uh, most of you have an LDAR program for leak detection and repair. Uh, we've been doing that for five or six years now. Uh, pneumatics, replacing our pneumatics, where uh, from high bleed to low bleed pneumatics, get rid of those emissions. And then North Dakota, the flaring, which really came out of North Dakota's uh, flaring task force, which I was lucky enough to uh, chair, uh, I don't know, in the before times. Uh, it's really this idea of pre-planning the natural gas infrastructure. So don't have, don't be flaring until you have that gas infrastructure there to uh, take the pipe away or take the gas away. So. And then uh, we have a closed loop gas capture system, and I'll show you that. That's to, uh, for the flaring side, is how we're gonna reach uh, a really zero routine flaring. And I'll, I'll show you that here in a minute. You can see our methane emissions, again, we're trying to get down to zero percent methane, uh, or 0 0.06 by 2025. And then on the combustion side, we're using electric frack fleets. We have six running right now in the company and probably I think uh, one of the highest usages in the company or in the uh, industry. So our closed loop, ga closed loop gas capture system, this is 
Again, if uh, looking at the, uh, the picture there, in the upper right-hand corner you have a red X, and that's the upset condition down uh, at the natural gas processing, or there's pigging going on, or routine maintenance, that type of thing. So you have an upset event. So how are we going to not flare during that? So what we're doing is what we're calling closed loose ga gas capture, and that's the dashed red line with the blue dotted around it. So basically, we're going to replumb and capture that gas that would be going to flare during the upset. We're going to go back to production and then re-inject it into uh, the production facility. So when the upset is over, then we'll start producing that again. So there are some things that have to be done there. You have to have a lot of metering. You have to have uh, flow control of the gas during that time. So the idea is during these upset events, which in North Dakota, we, there's several force majeure clauses that you can still um, you know, flare, but we're trying to go to zero flaring as a corporation. So that's uh, something that was uh, created by our innovative uh, staff. On the water re reuse side, we keep pushing more and more water reuse. So you can see our percentages uh, are increasing there. The green is the, is the reuse percentage across all operations and uh, trying to use less and less refresh. And I'll talk about a little bit about uh, the way we're doing that is a system called Trident. This is an internally developed uh, system that is really integrates our, again, technology, IT side with water. So it's an interactive tool uh, that manages our costs, the volume of water, and, our, and it actually looks at the, the chemistry of the produced water in real time. So we can mix, blend, move things around in the oil field. Uh, we can also do scenario planning, which is very important. We can look at historic production data, and then we can forecast future data. So as we bring on a, a well field or a number of wells, we can actually uh, plan the water use or, uh, for that field. It also anticipates takeaway, uh, the needs uh, for takeaway capacity if we need to invest in infrastructure. So that, again, helps us uh, minimize our trucking, minimize impacts from that type of thing. So. Uh, it re reduces our fresh water use, and then um, it's really a model for cost-effective and infrastructure uh, investment. So once we see where those invest, where we have to make those investments, we can then make the smart, real-time de decisions. Again, the whole idea is that driving innovation, driving down costs, and in the low-carbon environment, this is going to be more and more important. And then I just want to spend the last uh, one second. Uh, on government policies, the panels before us, they're so important uh, to have uh, proactive government policies such as uh, this, the North Dakota State Legislature. They're re refreshing and they're moving forward the way they're helping us out. And uh, the flexibility that we need as we innovate is going to be super important in the field. So um, anyway, uh, that's EOG, my talk here today. And I would just say go out and innovate. North Dakota, again, is leading, as we led on uh, flaring across the nation, and I think uh, North Dakota can lead in many other aspects. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Um, one quick question. Uh, so the state is, is rapidly advancing its ESG approach, and we are in the process of hiring an ESG consultant mm -hmm. to educate mid-majors and, and smaller organizations on how they can position themselves more effectively for this, this sort of new paradigm. Do you see any low-hanging fruit within the ESG space here in the state of North Dakota that we should be focused on? Well, again, I'd say uh, the things that we're, we're focusing on, emission reduction, um, you know, the water reuse, the ability to move water around, all those types of things. Um, and uh, flexibility to do that. I would say in the federal space, we're seeing uh, the idea uh, to co-mingle production so that you can reduce footprint um, and get economy of scale on uh, larger DSU drilling uh, spacing units so that you can uh, manage the air emissions better and those types of things. So those are some ideas, just uh, quickly, James, on that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, our, second, our second speaker for this session is Kevin Black. Kevin is the Chief Executive Officer of Credence Energy Services, a leader in the marketplace for cutting-edge chemistry development and advanced data analytics. In 2021, Credence expanded its product portfolio through a partnership with Locus Bioenergy, developing a biosurficant 
biosurfactant technology, my apologies, uh, for use in enhanced oil recovery and allowing for a low capex option to increase production. Kevin will speak to us today about how enhanced oil recovery's future is going green. Please welcome Kevin Black. Thank you, James, and thank you, uh, Ron and Carrie and the rest of the team at the Petroleum uh, Council for pulling off this conference. It's uh, really incredible to be together and to see so many familiar faces. I even see some NDSU green and gold down here in the front row with Dr. Kalk, so uh, you're making me feel right at home there, Brian. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it and say go Bison. Uh, like James said, my name is Kevin Black, and I'm one of the co-founders of Credence Energy Services. Uh, a family founded company alongside my cousins Wyatt and Malachi Black who are with us here today. And we're really thrilled to uh, unveil a, a brand new innovation that we've been working on for over a year called our C-STEM series of enhanced oil biosurfactants. Surfactants. Um, we are, uh, we're excited to share some data that we've never released before publicly and we're going to share that at the end. Uh, but before I get too far, I want to acknowledge just a few people. Number one, Eric Nelson, our technical director, who has been really the champion at Credence for innovation and developing new chemistries. And then our partners in this entire journey, Locus Bio. Um, with us today is Martin Shumway, the, our, their, their technical director. Um, and it has been an incredible partnership of innovation and ideas to figure out how we, through chemical enhanced oil recovery, can play a role in the future production of the Bakken. So before we dive into what this chemistry actually is, I think it's important to frame the conversation a bit and really contextualize why enhanced oil recovery is important moving forward. On the left hand side you see the typical Bakken decline curve. This is something uh, most of you are all very familiar with. It's a reality we have to deal with. What I think is really interesting is the graph on the right which comes from Justin Kringsid and the Pipeline Authority uh, at, our, at the House Appropriations Committee in January. And to me, it's a very profound graph because it shows the history of North Dakota production from 2014 through January. And then what happens is there's a series of models of where production may go depending on the number of completions per month. And we see there's that magic number, number somewhere between 60 and 70 completions that we need to be doing per month to maintain our current production of about 1.2 million barrels per day. The reality is since about February, however, we've been hanging out somewhere between 30, 40, the numbers are, are still coming in, I think, on April, somewhere around maybe 50 completions per month. So um, in the absence of new completions technology and in the absence of enhanced oil recovery, um, it's not unreasonable to see where production may go between that 900,000 and a million barrels a day as we get three, four years out. So what does that mean? It creates an environment for replacing that lost production, yet we still face a lot of challenges, as um, many of the senators and representatives alluded to at the earlier panel. Uh, we have uh, an issue with access to cap uh, uh, capital, access to capital, right? And it's not just with the oil and gas industry, it's within the oil and gas industry. We have to recognize that in the Bakken, we are in competition every single day for capital with the Permian. The second thing is navigating new policies. Uh, we have a new administration. I'd love to take a quick poll on how everybody feels about that, uh, but I think I know the answer. Uh, but that means that you know, we are facing new hurdles and new challenges with drilling and completing new wells. And then finally, we have this evolution of ESG, which has been creeping our way for a couple years. And the fact is that investors, whether uh, private, institutional, public, investors are demanding that companies in oil and gas embrace ESG initiatives. So we think through our biosurfactant technology we can check a lot of these boxes. We're not talking about multi-million dollar refracts um, or very expensive EOR projects. We're talking about low capex treatments that can be ROI in less than 90 days. We're also talking about not drilling new wells or completing new wells. We're talking about re-stimulating existing wells, uh, wells that have been depleted uh, somewhere in the range of 100 uh, to 10 barrels per day. And then finally, which I think is really exciting, is the fact that this chemistry is a 100% clean, green, and sustainable product. I know that is a buzzword that gets overused all the time, 
But when we say biosurfactant, what we mean it is actually biogenically synthesized, uh, manufactured with North Dakota agricultural products. And so we're able to literally create a sustainable chemistry solution for enhanced oil production. A little bit more about our journey here before I jump in. A little over a year ago, we started this partnership with Locus. We spent thousands of hours in the lab and in the field validating the technology. And we took it to the oil and gas research program back in December. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, there is a grant program through there. You first must go through, though, a very, very rigorous uh, technical review. Uh, we were very pleased that we got a 7 to 0 unanimous do recommend for a grant that went to the Industrial Commission, the Governor, the Attorney General, the Ag Commissioner, and they also unanimously approved this for just under a $250,000 grant to actually trial this chemistry right here in North Dakota. And that's what we're going to share with you here today. So what is this? Um, the chemical term for this surfactant is called a Sephora lipid. Again, the bio refers to the biogenic nature of the product. And one exciting part is uh, the fact that it falls into the class of what's called nanosurfactants. Um, it is a very, very small molecule, so small it's actually smaller than the strand of human DNA. How do we apply it? It's very simple, actually. We essentially mix the chemistry with a, a pill of fresh water, and it is pumped down into the wellbore. Uh, it does not require special equipment. It doesn't require a huge footprint out on the location. We can simply put this away with a frac pump or a rig pump um, and to essentially squeeze it in to the, to the formation using a huff and puff technique. And then finally, what is the goal? The goal is quite simple. We're trying to get more oil out of the ground. We hear all the time about how can we move that needle? How do we crack that code and get that extra couple percent of oil out of the ground? Uh, we're not claiming this is the magic uh, bullet by any means, but we do believe this could play a very meaningful role in uh, turning that dial. So how do surfactants work? Um, I, I, it's not lost to me that trying to do a chemistry lesson this close to happy hour is very dangerous, but I'm going to just really quickly tell you the 10,000-foot the, the overview of surfactants. Um, and this isn't unique to just biosurfactants. This is all surfactants. The first thing we try to do in EOR is change the wettability of the rock. Um, there's a lot of different techniques, uh, contact angle modifiers. Um, that is exactly what we're doing here. We're, when you change the wettability of the rock, you can mobilize more oil. Pretty simple. Our goal here is to water wet the formation. Um, the best way to think of this is like Rain-X, right? You, know, you go to the, the car wash, do you put the Rain-X on or don't you? You know, it's always a debate I have with myself. But in this case, we want to use the Rain-X in the oil field. And the, what the chemistry is doing is it's allowing us to water wet the formation so that just like when you apply the rain x when the rain hits your windshield, it beads up. We want the oil to beat up on the rock so it more easily mobilizes and flows to the wellbore. The second, uh, this is just an example of how we can replicate this in the lab. Very quickly, this is called an amet cell. This is actually amet cell testing done with actual Bakken core on our trial wells. And you can see we've we saturated the core with brine in the first uh, scenario, and in the second scenario, we inject our chemistry. And you can just see with the color change in the brine, we're extracting more oil. We're actually able to measure this through the amet cell on the top left. Um, that is where we can measure amount, the amount of oil that's extracted from the rock just by changing the wettability. Um, and you can see here with wells A and wells B, which were actual wells that were, used, that, that were stim re simulated, we're able to extract anywhere from 150 to 250 percent more oil off the rock. The second thing surfactants do is they reduce the interfacial tension and the surface tension. Uh, what is interfacial tension? It's basically just the force that exists between two dissimilar fluids, in this case, oil and water. If we can reduce that surface or that interfacial tension, we can more readily mobilize the oil. And then finally, if we can reduce the surface tension for the reservoir engineers and the engineers in the room, as you well know, then we can reduce the amount of capillary force that's required to mobilize the oil through the pore, pore space and back to the reservoir. Okay, chemistry lesson over. Um, what actually makes our surfactants different, our biosurfactants, than other surfactants used in this industry? Because they're used quite prolifically. The first one is that our biosurfactants are much more comp complex. There are much more uh, active sites on the chemistry, meaning that we can do much more or less, what, much more with less compared to the traditional alcohol ethoxylates that are used in frac chemistries. Uh, the second really important part is that we've been able to prove both in the field and in the lab 
that our chemistry can absorb to that rock face and desorb over time. Most surfactants, they go right down and they come right back up. We don't want to be a one-hit wonder in this case. We want a sustained effect, and that, that's what allows us to capture more oil off the rock. But if there's one slide that I definitely want you, uh, hopefully, to, to remember, it would be this one. I'm, I'm a very simple mind. Visuals mean everything to me. And in this case, this is a very, very powerful visual. Uh, most frac surfactants that are used um, are able to get in the hydraulic uh, fracture. Uh, they're about 100 nanometers. But as you can see, their size simply does not allow them to get into the micropores. Um, now, a couple years ago, a series of nano surfactants were released. They were about 15 to 20 nanometers in size. Um, and that's great, they could get into micropores, but what they couldn't do is to get into the nanopores. And that's where I'll go back to the size of our molecules. The size of the Credence biosurfactants are about 1.2 nanometers. That is incredibly small. As I said, human DNA is about 2.3 nanometers. It's a fun fact for your next family game of tri trivial pursuit. But it's important because of the grass on the right, and that is the pore throat size distribution of the Bakken and the three forks. From where you're sitting, it's, it's probably very difficult to tell, but what is it showing is what is the distribution of the size of the pore throats? And what we see is that over 50% of the Bakken and even up to 75% in the three forks, the pore throat radius distribution is less than 20 nanometers. So really the magic of this chemistry is that we're able to penetrate further and deeper into the rock to mobilize more oil. So this is uh, the first time we're, we're actually going to reveal some of this production data with the blessing of the operator. As I mentioned, we, we received uh, grant funding to do 11 stimulations, three one-mile laterals, three two-mile laterals, and five conventionals. So far, we've done five of them. Um, we just did the two milers, um, so we don't have data available yet for that, but we do have data on the one mile laterals, and we think this is really exciting. Um, this, is a, this is well A, as I'll refer to it. It is on the eastern front of the Bakken. Um, it is a well that was drilled in 2008, one mile, and uh, th this is a logarithmic scale, but you know, if you remember back to that very first slide, definitely has the traditional steep Bakken decline curve. And really for the last year, it has been flatlined at about 20 barrels a day and heading downward. So at the beginning of April, we went out and we treated our very first biosurfactant treatment. And what you can see here is the production response. This well was treated with about 3,000 barrels of fresh water. So our initial expectation is we're going to get a lot of water back. What's remarkable is we actually did it. Uh, we are still returning after 30 days a lot of that initial treatment. Um, and in fact, we have uh, found that our oil to water ratio has increased. Um, we initially spiked over 70 barrels, which, you know, most people say, yeah, so what, no big deal. Um, but what we're excited about is we sustained about a 42 barrel a day rate since then. We actually just got this last, this last week's data back a few moments ago. Um, and I'm happy to say we're right between that 30 and that 40 barrels a day. So what does that mean? We've increased production anywhere from 50 to 100%. Our goal is to sustain this production over the course of the year um, and provide an overall incremental oil production of 50% above the previous forecast, which was 20 barrels a day. Now here's what also is very exciting. If we do that, we will ROI this well two and a half times. Um, our moderate goal here is 50%. We've already, over the course of 12 months, our goal is to increase at 50%. We are already 25% of the way there in 30 days, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, the second well that we, uh, that we stimulated a, a few days later, basically the same story. This well was drilled in 2009, again about 20 barrels a day. Um, and here we saw that same response. It is now leveling off, but again this week we're right in that 30 to 40 barrel mark and that's where we expect it to hang out as it goes back to the 20 barrel towards the end of the year. Um, and a conservative, very conservative goal of increasing at 25% production, we're already 60% of the way in just 30 days. So as you can imagine, this operator is incredibly excited. They, they actually only took two of the trial wells initially. Um, they immediately after seeing this response jumped on the third one, so we'll be putting the third job in the ground here uh, very shortly. So 
okay, great, we can get a response. It will maybe last for a year is probably what you're asking yourself, but can we do it again? And the answer to that is yes, we believe we can. Uh, Locust has been doing these treatments for uh, three years now. This is an example from an Upper Devonian sandstone well in Pennsylvania. This was a well that was just about to be plugged and abandoned, uh, down to about two barrels a day. Uh, we, the well was stimulated with the biosurfactant, jumped up to 12 barrels a day, and sustained a response for over 540 days, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, it was then re-stimulated, and that sustained response, as you can see a second time, has uh, held for now over a year. Um, of course, this is Pennsylvania, that is Pennsylvania, and this is the Bakken, I get that. But we believe because of the poor throat size and the tight shale play here in the Bakken, there's true applicability and opportunity for this chemistry. Um, this is another really important graph because what this does is it shows how by using EOR, and, and this actually came from that Devonian well, by using the chemical EOR and increasing the amount of oil we can recover, we can actually change the value of the estimated ultimate recovery and change the value of the asset, which we think is uh, probably pretty interesting to some of you. So we like, to, we like to dream big, we like to innovate at Credence, and we like to think about what could this be? And so what we did is, with the help of Justin Kringstead, um, we, we, we compiled the, the distribution of wells by production. And what we find, and this was kind of staggering to me, we now have over 15,000 wells that produce less than 100 barrels a day. It's, it's pretty remarkable. I don't think, that, that wasn't a number I was expecting or, or used to yet. We were used to, uh, used to having so many of the bigger wells. But when you stack up all of those wells that are under 150 barrels a day, that represents about 670,000 barrels per day of production. So what if, what if we could just do these EOR stimulation treatments on those wells and increase it by, by 25%? Well, you can see we can increase production to over 840,000. That's what the math, this is just some back of the, back of the napkin math. If you can increase it 50%, you can get up closer to a million barrels a day, and so on and so forth. So while this might not be the end-all be-all, we think it can play a meaningful role in increasing production here in the state of North Dakota. And then I'll just close with this one really fun and important fact. And as I mentioned earlier, the biosurfactants um, and really what, what Bi Locust Bio has been able to do is to find a way to manufacture these products on scale so that they can be used in the oil field. This technology has been around for 20 years. It's been used in pharmaceuticals, it's been used in high-end skincare, but it's never been able to be fermented and produced on a mass scale that would make it economically viable for the oil field. Um, our goal here is if we can prove concept and if we can scale the project up, that in working with Locust Bile, we'll be able to actually manufacture this product right here in North Dakota. Um, it's, it's manufactured through a fermentation process, much like alcohol is, that might get some of you interested. Um, and it's two primary ingredients, ingredients are canola oil and sugar beets, two crops that we have an abundance of right here in North Dakota. So we believe that if we can scale this up, we can literally manufacture a bridge between oil and in energy, which, uh, oh, excuse me, energy and agriculture. So um, we're really excited about this. Um, I breezed and I, I skimmed through a lot of the technical data and I realized that. Um, so we have a whole team at our booth, booth 415. Uh, we would love to sh uh, share more technical data with you and more of the results that we're seeing so far. But uh, thank you, James, and thank you to the Petroleum Council for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> this is this is amazing. Um, just just even on the conservative end, you know, I cited ag during my intro because we've been very adept in this region at accelerating innovation and entrepreneurship. Do you see similar threads within the entrepreneurial community in the energy sector, and do you see that exponentially increasing over the next several years as a result of some of the external factors, perhaps that Eric mentioned with respect to ESG? obviously the, uh, the ability to, to extract more oil, et cetera. So what's your perspective as an entrepreneur and where you think the energy innovation culture is heading? Um, I, I, I'm really grateful to say, I think within the energy sector, we have a phenomenal entrepreneurial community. 
Um, can't thank Ron Ness enough for the invitation to testify in House Bill 1452 this year. I think our legislature took some really important steps to, you know, put our money where our mouth is and invest in entrepreneurs and invest in innovators. Um, and through bills like 1452, the Lyft program and other programs, um, it gives entrepreneurs the, the fuel to get these projects off the ground. These are enormous lifts. This is a very complicated technology and uh, initiating change is not always easy. And so having that capital, um, having the support, just having the stamp of approval from the North Dakota Industrial Commission to go out and do these trials uh, was, was really a game changer for us. So. Thank you, Kevin. You know, I, I just want to touch up on that a little bit. Uh, this legislative session, I know the panel of legislators were here before, but we do have quite a few really unique investment vehicles moving into the future with respect to cultivating an innovation and entrepreneur culture. Whether it's 1452 Lyft, uh, the new state investment board approach for the legacy fund, et cetera. And equally as important, we've, we've challenged the federal government. I've had the opportunity now to meet with uh, several, we'll just say sub cabinet level folks at the DOE, the DOD and other agencies. And the idea is, hey, we agree, we all want to get to the same place. We all want to massively produce clean energy production in a domestic environment that improves energy security. But we, we believe in innovation, not regulation. And so we're asking you, we're making these investments. Private industry is 10, 15 xing these investments. So we're asking you as a federal government to come with us, join us, 2x, 3x, grow that sort of side-by-side -side investment and cultivate this culture. So I'm really excited as the Commerce Commissioner to, uh, to see this movement. And uh, it's really exciting to have this panel of entrepreneurs. Thank you again, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. He's going to enlighten us today on wellhead and sand filtration innovation, Jake Feel is the CEO of SanPro Limited Liability Corporation. Jake is a North Dakotan with a huge passion for engineering, innovation, and customer service, which has led SanPro to be focused on innovation of well site services and equipment, including sand filtration, wellhead pressure control, and equipment automation provided on a global scale. Please share a warm welcome for Jake Field. All right, thanks, James. Yeah, it's uh, it's so cool to be standing up here with you know all your fellow guys and you know seeing all the innovation coming from all different angles, and that that's what it really takes to get us moving in the right direction. So today I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Not not a bunch on chemistry or anything. That's that was that was really good, but I would get a little more into uh, well site services on location. Uh, a little bit more boots on the ground and how we can help some of these things within the industry come uh, come together from a, from a services side. Okay, so just before I start, and you know, I'm going to get ahead of myself again here, but we got a quick scope. So I'm going to talk about some of the types of innovation, um, how we evaluate automation and innovations um, in our business, and wellhead innovation market advancements with pressure control. And then also the uh, sand capture um, on the production of the well through uh, sand management. Okay, so we think of it here a couple of different ways, right? You have transformational innovation. You have core innovation. And you have uh, expanding innovation, right? So every single one of these things is super important to take into context when you're, uh, when you're developing a product. So what we're really going to talk here is how we evaluate these innovations. Not by, SAMPRO wasn't, wasn't built to have a model that came to market in, uh, in, in a year. That, that's a, we feel a, long, a lot of the strongest challenges in our environment is to develop something and actually get it to market. Not only getting it to market, but getting it to market where it's affordable. Where, where it actually creates some sort of economic benefits for the end user. If we can't get it to the market, and we can't get it there cost effectively, then we're going to get left behind, right? Then you have other innovation models. You have your open innovation model, which you know is a little bit more flexible. I like to look at things on a little bit of a different, different way, right? We have market products. We're a service company. We do automation. Um, we're here to help people 
achieve their goals. So how, how do we do that, right? We're going to do that through either meeting with that operator, meeting with that service provider, um, sitting down and discussing what are the challenges that they're having, number one. And number two, how can we help create these efficiencies alongside them, right? Sometimes the innovation can come easy. It can, it can be something that is a small step. Sometimes it can take a whole process of change, but we're here to guide on that. So we first work with the operator or service provider to identify what specific areas of their operation or efficiency that we can improve on. Then we, def then we go through the improvement strategy. This is, this is one of the most important things that, that you go through. If, if you can't have the proper improvement strategy and you can't, can't create the economics, there's nothing there to gain. Once we quantify the economics, we can now put this into perspective. We've come up with a valid idea, a valid solution, a valid implementation plan, and we've actually created and quantified economics to go along with it. That, for us, is the perfect recipe, okay? Then you got to, you know, my funnel here looks like an hourglass, which is, which is a little weird, but sometimes it doesn't come out the other side right. So there's no such thing as a perfect funnel. But when you, the other key things to the implement is to the implementation is the value. So how do you create that value? All the products or anything that you, you innovate can be, you know, a product, a way of doing things, um, or just a, a simple practice or operational improvement that you make within your organization. But I can tell you one thing, it needs functional integration. And if you want to be a service provider and you want to stand out, you have to do more than just install. You, you cannot just sell somebody a product and walk away. Things are ever evolving and are going to need constant maintenance, and that's how you're going to build the customer relationship. Then I would say, I mean, as these guys sat up here, it's, I mean, it just shows that continual improvement is, is where we're at. We, we can't be sitting here with, you know, blinders on or getting in the tunnel thinking that, you know, nothing's, nothing's going to change. We have to be able to pivot and we have to be able to keep up with the marketplace. But besides the, besides the funnel, this, it really breaks down to three major things for me. First, can we create value? That's, that's all there is. Whether that's working with that operator or working with the service provider, can we create value? Is that value sustainable? Did we create something that is now going to cost more on another side? Then the third, is that value expandable, right? How, how can we take that product and or that service and bring inroads to other avenues to go along with it? As an example of something that was expandable, you know, I think uh, Coca-Cola did a, a, a great job. You know, you have Coke, you have Cherry Coke, you have Vanilla Coke, you have Lime Coke. They just expanded on what they were already good at, right? They didn't, they didn't do something completely off the wall. They did what they were good at. So I'm going to give you guys an example today that is, um, this is a completions location. Uh, we call it our, our M series. Um, this is going to be all the, the products wrapped around the hydraulic fracturing, and I'm going to show you how we get it to come together. So of course you have conventional products, right? Some things that aren't going to go away. They might be, you know, changed, advanced, made better, but for now they're not going anywhere. So from a simple glance, yeah, it's a, it's a fracture. And, and now we're going to talk about how that's expandable. So we have a fractory on a location. We have a zipper manifold. You know, as in some of the previous conversations, we talked about uh, you know, stimulating multiple wells at once or quick diversion, uh, creating efficiencies. We have M-Line. Uh, this is, this is a, uh, another prime example. There, there's a lot of things in the industry that people think we got to do it, you know, really reinvent that hamster wheel. What, what this looks like at a simple glance is 
just some pieces of pipe. It, it, well, Jake, it's been done that way for years. You're right, it has. Well, it's not the, the new hose. It's not this, you know, thing that's got chrome rims. But what you don't see is that that actually is a conventional piece of equipment with a very, very minor modification. And that minor modification allows for a six degree per aside rotation on the fly while still utilizing your 100% API ring groove and a solid metal flange. So we are mixing conventional technology with some technology, okay? Next thing is an M grease. So we all know that valves need grease, right? When they, they, they operate, they need to be greased. Well, again, do we need to really reinvent something or can we talk about how we can deliver that grease in a better way? And how we deliver it in a better way is, is through the M grease. The M grease operates off of knowing which valve you operate and it automatically injects the correct amount of grease needed for that valve on the fly. Then in conjunction with that, it works with the M watch. The M watch is a frac site monitoring system that will allow you and tell you the status of every single valve on that location. They all work via position sensors and uh, I'll, get to, I'll show you here in a minute how that, how that works. The M-Lock is uh, one, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite products. This is the, the primary example of not reinventing the wheel and just looking how you can improve on something. Typically, from a hydraulic latch perspective on a completions location, you're going to have a hydraulic latch system for each individual well. That creates lots of hydraulic hoses, lots of mechanical components uh, to fail. What did we do? We worked around a way to flip it upside down and put one on a location. Seems simple, right? Okay, then what we do is we have a system that's called M-Control. What M-Control does is literally takes all of the systems that are in communication on the well site, uh, gives the operator or service provider the ability to monitor and regulate all of those products via the M-Control. M-Control is an interface that can be used on uh, desktop devices and can be used mobily as well. Okay, so not, since I don't have a bunch of time and now I'm, now I'm spending it, you know, talking about all those products, but I, I did have a product highlight here which, which I was highlighting the M-Grease. And I think why this is important is because when we talked about, you know, something being expandable. So as you can see um, on, the, on the left hand side of the screen, that is a simple uh, back of a, uh, a gate valve. And the only thing that was added was, was the, the cover in the sensor packages, right? That cover in the sensor packages took the conventional technology, allowed it to communicate with the M grease, tell it when it needed grease, and then also allowed it to communicate with the M watch to tell you the position of all of your valves. Okay, now, now M Watch. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's pretty cool, but but what does it what does it do? Uh, the the main thing with M Watch is you know, I would 20 to 25 percent of repair costs that operators are seeing um, on a mechanical piece of equipment is due to the operation of it. It's very simple for a valve not to be all the way open, not to be all the way closed or simply vibrate a little bit open or vibrate a little bit closed. That'll increase repair costs and decrease your economics, and that's not what we're trying to do. Okay, so this is just an example on the M-Watch on, on how, you know, in a very generic version of, of what you would see, right? So your, uh, your well is, you know, red is closed. All of a sudden, that's blinking. Well, your, that means your valve isn't all the way closed, and you started to vibrate open. You open close, and this will work all the way through the entire sequence of the job. Now again, talking about expandable. So what else can we use this data for? What, why, why, else would, why else would that be important? There's a lot of system, when you, when, when you talk innovation, there can be some challenges. People coming out with, with specific products to serve a specific purpose. 
Well, a lot of times you can't just keep stacking all those things on top of each other because now you're not going to create any economics. Everything's just going to get super expensive. As an example, since we know when and why all of these valves are open or closed and how long they're open or how long they're closed, we now have an algorithm where we can, we can detail out your frack operations just by understanding when the valves open and when they close and when there's pressure in the wellbore. We can tell you how long it took for wireline. We can tell you how long it took for frack. We can tell you all those things. It's not overcomplicated, and it's an expandable solution. Okay? Real quick, I'm gonna, I'll run through the uh, uh, production site, which is the, uh, the second half here of, of sand management, which has you know, really, really hit our, hit our market hard. We went for years where, uh, from a service perspective, you know, equipment was lasting a long time, wasn't seeing a significant amount of damage. That all changed once 100 mesh and smaller started getting pumped started wreaking a bunch of havoc, not only on the equipment, but also on the, on the recovery side. So a traditional type of sand management is gonna use a centrifugal effect, right? You're, everything is about the weight of a solid. Well, we took it a step further when we, let me see here. Okay, so we, our 1440 filter unit is, has an actual positive barrier. So when we talk sand management, anything that is lighter than you know, probably 80 mesh sand is just gonna carry over in your fluid. And what we found out in numerous trials with numerous customer success stories is that it's, it's a very unique challenge to try and capture those solids without having a positive barrier in place. Well now if you don't have a positive barrier in place, uh, how do we not get that to clog, right? So we need to have a self-cleaning positive barrier. In addition, on the production site, you can also have MWatch, tells you the position of all your valves on your production site. MSafe, which is a surface safety valve that I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna get, I get excited about this innovation. I actually have a slide next, so I'm not gonna get on it too much here. Um, let's see here. And then we have an M-Sand, and the M-Sand is an automated sand, sand dumping system to allow the disposal of the sand solids that are captured. We have M-Way, which is an automated weigh tank to help the operator again quantify the, uh, the amount of sand that they are getting back. We have MBOP, which is a hydraulic operated uh, rod BOP, allows the operator to produce the well um, and when the well hits the outside of the operational parameters, um, the hydraulic BOP is then closed and notified through the PLC. One thing, again, to pull all of this together is a, you know, a system we call M-Suite. So what we do is, again, we, we tie everything together, giving the operator the ability um, to monitor and measure those, those metrics and, and operate remotely. So here, here's the quick highlight. From the M-Safe perspective, it's an electronic over hydraulic emergency shutdown controller. When this product was developed, this product was developed to give you, to stabilize your emergency surface safety valve. One of the problems we identified on the market was nitrogen and or traditional hydraulic surface safety valves. Now, they work and they've, they've worked just fine with, with one little improvement that's needed. And that improvement on the hydraulic valve would mean a constant supply of hydraulic pressure to the reservoir to accommodate for temperature swings in our very volatile temperature environment. All we simply did was create an electronic over hydraulic controller that simply allowed us to retrofit to many existing valves or ours and stabilize that hydraulic reservoir to make sure your well is operating correctly. Um, the M filter, as we talked about, is a positive barrier and self-cleaning filter unit, and the M sand automated sand dumping system. The biggest thing with the, uh, the M safe is no maintenance. So one, one important thing is the, the CO2 rating, which I strongly encourage 
any of you that are, you know, whether you're looking for a product, um, whether you're developing one of your own, um, to look at some of the third-party, you know, uh, labs like SEAL where you can get your product tested. Um, that stands for it's a safety index level two, which gives it a 0.00035% chance of a failure. Right? Now, again, on the sand filter units, now it, from the outside, looks like a traditional unit. Well, well, it is. It's a traditional unit with a little bit of technology. All we did was change the fluid dynamics of when it enters that vessel. Number two, took the direct pressure off of the filter. And number three, we're able to implement a positive barrier to allow us to capture sand down to 40 micron and or 200 mesh. So all of these things, again, we're, 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 we're standing here, we're, we're talking innovation, and it, again, it is so cool to be able to see people working it from, from all different angles right here in, in, our, in our home state, right? And when we, when we talk about mixing, everybody mixing all these solutions, that's how we're going to end up with the right recipe. You know, you have operators, you know, closed loop system, you have, you know, the proper chemical being injected. All of these things are going to bring us to the next steps of our innovation. So I, I, th I thank everybody for that. Oh, I'm going the wrong way here. So I, I again, in, in closing, I, uh, again, I want to say thank you for you guys uh, allowing me to come up here. Um, we're, we're, we're proud to be here, and we're, we're glad we could get, get the hell out of the house and, uh, you know, shake some hands and, and, and get to cocktail hour here pretty quick. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. What's that? I was going to ask a question, but I'll make a quick comment. This, uh, this SandPro presentation, if you look at transform, uh, transformative efforts, SAS platform for coordinating and forecasting activities with the goal of optimizing operations and improving safety. Today, Rob will tell us more about how the TrackFrac track platform optimizes SIMOPS between companies. Please welcome me in joining Rob Lindbergh. Thanks, James. I actually hosted this, this time slot three years ago for the event, so I, I'm back on stage, I guess. Um, I am standing between everyone in happy hour, so I will make sure that if Kevin was on time, I can also be on time. And so, especially these guys, these guys have a party. <laughs> um, so the whole premise of, of my presentation today is that communication demands better communication, and it's a double entendre for the communication that happens between fracks and how operators can better help themselves uh, through using a platform such as ours. And so what we do is we essentially allow up operators to upload their schedules or add it from a server connection, and we display it in some way that makes it useful to them. Gantt charts, maps, multiple views, downloads in Excel, all those sorts of things, or CSV. And so we're the only system that automates the regulatory compliance required for meeting the uh, three states that require notice. Then that's North Dakota, Colorado, and Oklahoma. And we send those notices by email um, to any operator, whether they're on our system voluntarily or there's an email address known from them, they get a free account. So what's the real need of this? When we look at North Dakota, and we're going to look at 2019 because 2020 didn't count, um, there were 1,245 wells that were completed in the state. And that created 24,000 different interactions between the parent and the child wells and that's within 1,500 feet. And that's generally where we see our customers uh, applying some level of frack protect. Some are more, some are less. It really depends on the rock. And we'll go over this in a little bit, but it turns into about a billion dollars of lost production in the uh, Bakken at that 2019 activity levels. So the whole premise of our system is to make that process easy. Right now, it's generally a engineer, uh, lower level engineer, a land person, a tech. Uh, we've had regulatory people. Uh, I know there's one company that sends out 
uh, certified mail to their neighbors, and, and they're drawing boxes on GIS maps and identifying wells and trying to use information that they've collected from other companies to send those uh, processes out. It's a really bad use of their time. These are smart people who can be better utilized doing non-admin functions. And it's also very unreliable, Re relying on people to be on the ball for the deadlines they need to make. Um, by the way, every three state has a different timeline for that. And it really means that workover rigs are being scrambled um, outside of a production or a normal schedule that they have already established for the well maintenance of other wells. And so we want to improve that, get better visibility. And the other part of it, too, is because we have all the wells in our system for the whole country, our system set up to meet the regulatory requirements of those three states, we can cover the entire nation in one process, one 30-second upload per week from um, a staff person. Or in the case of uh, other companies, including ConocoPhillips, they're giving us the schedule just right from their server to ours, and so nobody's touching it anymore. And so when we look at this, who's really benefiting? And so far, it's, it's either a good neighbor program or it's a, uh, a regulatory required program. But the benefits, if we do this the right way, really extend to every department. And so the completions team knows that when they send a frack crew out, that frack crew is able to perform their job and their non-performing time or non-productive time is going to be lessened because their neighbor knows that schedule and knows that their well needs to be prepared. The drilling crew knows that they're not going to send a drilling rig out and then look over the hill and find a frack crew uh, 1,200 feet away. We actually have one customer who uses our system to try to market their oil uh, in the DJ Basin to different buy points because of offset production in area. They think they can get, I don't know, five cents more, 10 cents more a barrel by rerouting that oil. And so there's different strategies there. We'll kind of let each company decide what there is, but we know those first three are definitely uh, better able to get their jobs done, especially production. When they know what the schedule is, they have so much more efficiency that comes from that. And we'll walk through that later. But here's what the platform really is. It's the getting started is pretty easy. We create the account, give it to the E&P lead for, uh, for getting them implemented. We have all the wells assigned to every single operator in the nation. We, uh, we get data from Rystead, IHS, who we have a strategic partnership with, as well as uh, we source a number of pieces of information ourselves. And so that person can add other users to the, to the account, um, and they automatically have their wells assigned to that. All right. Here's a simple CSV upload. It's about a dozen fields. That, in 30 seconds a week, gets the job done, maybe three minutes of editing. Um, on the desktop. So we're talking about nationwide compliance and simply minutes. This is what the dashboard looks like. Um, we'll go over the timeline, but Eric, I think you saw this about two years ago, and I did the coding on it. So um, this one I didn't code. And so this is, if we look at this, it's frack by frack, and now it's showing the offsets. And so I can limit at the top, which you can't see here, it's on the last slide, but I can sh choose the distance that I want to see offsets for. So if in my company I want to frack protect to 3,000 feet, I can set 3,000. I'll see all of my offsets to a certain frack. And then I can also see this well pad by well pad for almost every view. Um, frack to offsets, we have maps, and I uh, have the full well bores. And then what's really interesting on the production side, and this is where we make EMPs money. They're able to see how their currently producing wells are affected by fracks. And so now, what, this is an expanded well. Now you can see all the fracks that affect that well. And so if I'm looking at this and I'm the production manager, that kind of gap in the middle between wells, I might not bring that well back online. I don't have to send a workover, or I lose two workover rig trips because of that. And I'm not going to make enough money um, in that time period to pay for that workover rig. Here's a little bit about our timeline. And uh, in the past, as I said, I, was, I hosted this, and that was because I managed advocacy through the Bakken Pro Backers Program for the North Dakota Petroleum Council. And so in 2018, uh, 
in the basement of a restaurant uh, about four blocks from here, an E&P employee came and, or had dinner with me and we just talked about this issue of unreliable notifications that were being sent out. At that time, North Dakota required seven to 10 business days for notification. And we can uh, debate over happy hour what a business day in oil and gas is, maybe, maybe not Christmas. Um, and so it was very confusing, very unreliable, and in such a tight timeline, a guy goes on vacation, he forgets to send it, or a guy gets it, the notification, but he's on vacation, um, can't get it through his company fast enough. Or in the case of certified mail, it goes to the mail room, goes to the legal department, and um, in a month after the frack, everyone's notified. So the, uh, the key points in this, though, are in June of 2019, the DJ Basin selected TrackFrack as its one sole platform. Uh, it, before that, it was a person at Noble, now Ox, or excuse me, Noble, now Chevron, who was collecting the schedules, and he had two team members every single week who were compiling everybody's schedules over Monday and Tuesday in order to meet a Wednesday operator call uh, between them all. And so we took that workload off of them, gave them the platform. We have a mix of paid and free. And so those that don't want to pay us can operate for free and help their neighbors and, and really get the core benefits of this. And so since then, we've really developed the, uh, the platform a lot more. We do have Bakken users on it. And uh, the last key date was September of last year is when we entered into our IHS partnership. James, I probably should have said, too, that we got Lyft funding. So thank you. Um, but we're proven in the DJ. And so we were selected unanimously. And we took that schedule off of, uh, of Hunter's, who was the engineer, his responsibility week to week. And so we kind of walked through all this. But I think the key thing, and I, I say it again one more time, um, we did a survey early this year, late last year, and 100% of them said every basin should be using our platform. And so we, we built it hand in hand with them. And as I mentioned to Eric, you know, I coded this originally in my basement. And so it had to go somewhere else from there. But we proved the concept, and then we really built it out. So if we look at, built hand, we built um, SimOps Watchman, which is a sub -pro product of ours, right hand in hand with Oxy and Adarco. And that's that the drilling rig shows up, they see a frack crew somewhere close, or they do a little bit of analysis just as they're arriving on site, and they find that they violate one of these rules for uh, proximity to a past frack. And that, every time, costs them about $300,000. And so when we talk about efficiencies in oil and gas, every time we can take one of those $300 chunks out, the, uh, the better we get and the per foot costs go down. And so we're, we're doing as much as we can in that. So covered that. But how do we look for the Bakken? Um, the DJ Basin is a perfect case because everybody came on at the same time. In the Bakken, we have about six users. And we're adding uh, more and more commitments as we go, of course. But the compliance is difficult. We talked about these reasons before. We're relying on people to take time out of their real mission to do administrative tasks. And when that happens, people don't do it reliably. But we're losing a ton of production. And so we analyzed all the fracks in 2019 and looked at all the wells within 1,500 feet of them. We took the production from that month, applied it to those wells, and then took the uh, wellhead prices reported to the uh, state tax commissioner, and we valued that production. And so every six days of frack protect, which would be a general estimate, uh, or six days of frack protect applied to every well and every instance of a parent-child relationship, it costs the state about a billion dollars in total production in 2019 alone. And when we, look, when we look through what it costs for producers, it's about $770 million that year. That's a big number. I think the key takeaway, though, is if we can better deploy um, frack protect methods, we're able, by, and we reduce the, frack, the downtime by one day per well, we produce $128 million of extra revenue for oil and gas producers in North Dakota in just that single year. And so by sharing, by telling um, the neighbors when you're coming onto location with a frack crew, making sure that we have drilling rigs that aren't interacting, and we are properly preparing our wells, we can actually increase uh, the revenue across the board for things that we're already doing. 
So when we actually we did rank what the barrel and the uh, dollar cost impact was, and this is how that ranked out in order. Uh, I of course have those if you'd like to talk to me and um, ask about each company, come on by. But the other part of this is really making sure we don't end up in a um, in a situation that we don't want to be in. And so we also looked at the date that a well reached TVD in the drilling stage and then compared it to the stimulation window as reported on frac focus. And we, when we did that, we found 54 different wells that were drilled that were within 14 days of a frac in 2019. That's the situation we really want to avoid. 45 days, we see that grow, and at 90 days, it's, it's much larger. But we need to make sure that we're not sending drilling rigs into a uh, situation where the frac just left or is, is on site. And so I am five minutes ahead, which means by the time James asks a question, we should be about five minutes done early. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is always a good conference. Uh, and I, I, of course, have a lot of fun um, it, just being part of it. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. One quick question. Um, you know, you mentioned Lyft, and there have been other programs um, that, that have been cited today. Could you describe to some of the innovators and entrepreneurs in the crowd what your experience was like in, in terms of engagement? You know, a lot of people have a very, diff you know, they have a lot of great concepts, but then they have a lot of difficulty in terms of taking that leap. And so where did you find maybe a program like Lyft or other ones that you may have heard from some of your peer organizations? What, what that, what's that experience like for the young entrepreneur? Well, I, I do sit on the development fund, too, um, for the state of North Dakota, which is kind of a kissing cousin to Lyft. Um, we've used both. So when we started, I uh, started with $500 and about $30 of whiteboard um, in my basement and coded over Christmas and, and then over a couple more months to finish it out. Uh, we self-funded uh, for the next nine months when COVID hit. Uh, the development fund really helped us out with some interim cash, just, uh, you know, when everyone didn't know if the lights were going to turn on the next day. And then we made a uh, larger push into Lyft. And uh, I owe Tommy Kenville a whole lot of credit because he told me I just had to put in an app. And that was probably in December of 2019. And uh, I said, we don't need it. We're already starting to cash flow. I've got customers coming in. And uh, someone else should get the money. And he goes, we need somebody from the West. <laughs> Can you please put an app in? And so I did. Well, of course, February and March of 2020 hit. And um, it, it was very fortunate that um, Tommy encouraged me that. So, so I guess to answer your question, it's, it's you know, try to figure out where your place is first with your product a little bit. And then the state of North Dakota, whether it's Lyft or Development Fund or um, other programs, you know, Innovate ND is a great place to start too um, in that first stage. I, I think that North Dakota does a really good job supporting its entrepreneurs and um, it's been fun to be part of it too. So be before I turn the mic back over to Kathy and send you guys on the, to happy hour, I, I'm going to make a quick plug. Um, at Commerce and within other sort of state organizations, I just want you to be aware that it, it really doesn't matter what stage your company's in or where your concept is. We, we pretty much have a program for everything at this point. Um, whether it's a seed, seed stage concept, you know, you can, you can get up to 40K through Innovate ND and matching grants. Uh, the development fund is broken up into actually two buckets. So there's a venture component for more risky investments. Uh, if you're if you're not wanting to take on debt, we're willing to look at maybe some convertible equity. Uh, then there's more traditional, conventional products through the development fund, and then there's Lyft if you want to commercialize IP. And then there's a suite of about a half a dozen other programs that um, we think would be of value. And, you know, as you mentioned, uh, we do have a challenge in the West. And what I mean by that is I, I, don't, I don't know why there's a bifurcation in terms of our programmatic offerings, but there's a lot of money here, and we want you to take advantage of it. 
You've got a clean, you have a clean energy authority that was just stood up. You've got, you know, the Renewable Energy Council, the Lignite. All of these programs exist and we want you to be inspired. We want you to take advantage of it and accelerate your growth because this is a very capitally intense uh, industry. So um, that's my pitch. Um, we're open. We want to hear from you. We want to fund your projects. And um, you can just find me online. It's really simple. And we'll get you to the right concierge to move you through the process uh, expeditiously. So that said, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy, I believe. And I want to thank the panel again for just an amazing perspective regarding where we're heading within the innovation and entrepreneurial space. So thank you. Wow. Well, the technical talks are the heart of this conference, and that was over the top. James and company, thank you very much. That was great. And that brings us to the end of this first session of this Williston Basin Petroleum Conference. Um, the social does begin shortly. Please join us out in the exhibit hall. Um, walk around, enjoy the company, the networking, and getting back together. It is wonderful. Um, up next. Breakfast tomorrow morning starts at 7 a.m. The next session begins at 8 a.m. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone then. Thank you. Approved by the Board of Certified Safety Professionals, Columbia Southern University is the leader in occupational safety and health online education. Our professors are well versed in the safety industry and know what it takes to succeed in a safety career. At CSU, Associate, bachelor's, and master's programs are available, and textbooks are provided at no cost. Take the next step. Call 877-347-6050 or visit columbiasouthern.edu safety.